in New City Church. How's everybody doing? Ready for the word this morning? Hallelujah. The word is good. Come on, tell somebody it's good. It gives life. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to finish this series this morning on the book of Revelation. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Ooh, ready to come out of the book of Revelation. <laughs> no, I love it. It's my, as many of you know, my favorite book in the Bible. And so since this, this is the last message, I think I've appropriately titled it The Omega. The Omega. Ralph, I'm not talking about. <laughs> the purple. The Omega. <laughs> the end. Jesus said, I'm the beginning. And he said, I'm the end. He said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. And so I'm going to finish this series by looking at the end of the Bible. We, we look at the beginning, we look at the middle, we look at the almost end, but somehow we get to the very end and we said, oh no, well, just I know it's there, but I'm going to leave it alone. No, we need to know how it all ends. How many know that what we see today is going to end? Come on, come on, come on it's going to end. How many be happy when that day comes, praise the Lord, you know? In the meantime, let's love each other. Come on, enjoy life, though. You know, come on. Every day, like he told Daniel, live your life. Live your life. These things are coming. But live your life. Love. Come on. But we still need to know how it all ends. And we need to know where it ends. And here's a question out of the book of Revelation. Does it actually end? Does it actually end? How many of you will walk into an airport and buy a plane ticket not knowing where the plane is going? Not knowing the destination? Not knowing who owns the plane? Who maintains the plane? Not knowing who's flying the plane? Unless you're a real, real travel you know, maniac, nobody in their right mind would just walk in the airport and buy a plane ticket without knowing where the plane is going. Before you buy a ticket and board a plane, you would want to know the destination. I want to know who owns and maintains the plane. Any Southwest employees in here? No, I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> From a 25-year-old Delta employee. Come on, man. Who maintains that plane? I want to know who's flying it. Every man and woman born into this world takes a flight. You take a flight, and there's a pilot in the front, and it has a final destination. And by the book of Revelation, everyone buys the ticket. Everyone gets the ticket by choice or by default. And on this airport, I'm going to describe it from the Bible, there are only two planes to board. There are only two flights. Nobody gets to stay behind. And when you're walking down that corridor to those two gates, you, can, you may get a hint which flight you're on by what gate the flight is departing from. If it's gate 666, you might not want to. But if it's gate seven, that's the one you want. Come and tell you, David, you want gate seven. You want gate seven. <laughs> Beginning in Revelation chapter 20, what we see is the final approach and the final destination of those two flights. Two flights that unbeknown 
maybe when you're boarding the flight at the gate. They're not commercial flights, but they're really military flights. Flights of two opposing forces. You see, beginning in Revelation chapter 6, and for those of you who are here for the first time or the second time, this is the seventh message in this series, and the previous messages are out there on our YouTube channel or the website or the brand new app, you know, and we began in chapter 1, but if you, if you go, I think, about the third message in chapter 6, what we saw was the, the beginnings of a great final battle of a great war that began before man was created in the heavens. What we read was the alpha at that point, the alpha of a great war in the heavens. But today we read how it ends, the omega. And what I want to do today, I mean, you're kind of used to it, but it'd be more than typical, is I began to look through this epic part of the Bible, I began to realize not much room for preaching here. It's time to get out of the way and let the Word preach. There's too much that I don't quite understand, but there's plenty, plenty, plenty that we should all understand. And we need to, to, to read it because this is what they did in the early church. They came, and when they came to the synagogue, even the New Testament church, they read the Bible together. That was the primary. There was a meal, and there was a reading of the Scriptures. Tell somebody there's power in the Word of God. There's no room for mixture when you just read the Word of God. There's no room for, for my interpretation, which, which is sometimes off. As every man's interpretation is, sometimes a bit off. There's no room for that when you read. And this is to, to God. It's to the Father's business. It's to Jesus for me to leave room for error. And also this book, the book of Revelation, Jesus made it very clear in the second chapter, this was written to the churches. He said, I'm giving this word by, by my, my, my apostle John to be read to the churches. It's not for the new believer. It's not for the unbeliever. It's not for somebody lost in the street that, that hadn't gotten past John 3.16 yet. No, it, this is to the churches. So that we would know and we will be certain of who will win and who will lose. And that the church will respond as Christ would have his army. Come on, this is a military flight. Come on, tell somebody you're in the army. How Christ would have his army to respond. And so as I learned in my studies of the book of Revelation, which I'm, I'm, I'm a long way in now, oh, 15 years, it's no need to try to figure out lengths of time. No need to try to figure out yet symbolic names. I learned a while ago when, 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 when God looks at time and events, he sees it all as one picture. He sees it all from beginning to end in one glance. So when he says a hundred years, a thousand years, in God's mind, that's a moment. Because God is eternal. And he th sees things through an, an eternal lens, an eternal perspective. So don't try to count days so carefully the way God counts days. Like I said, even your life is just a vapor. Like a flower. 
the blossom and the petals fall to the ground. But you're eternal. Come on, tell somebody, oh. I can't go down that road. The real you is spirit. This is a carrier of the spirit. And let me do a quick funeral. One day he's going to give me another this. That'll never be sick. Never die. And look, Jesus told the woman in Samaria, I'm spirit. He said, of those who worship me, worship me in spirit and truth. And so we haven't learned anything else in this revelation that, that he, he, he presents himself as a man of a, with, with, uh, a witness, sometimes walking as a man, sometimes that glorified that John saw, sometimes as a, as a lamb standing in the throne room, uh, a, a lamb looking like he's slain, but he's alive. Sometimes as last week, he presents himself as, as a, a warrior on a white horse. So don't try to figure it all out, church. Just read and believe. Can I get an amen? Yeah. There's enough made plain to understand what Christ is doing. So I'm going to begin to read. I don't think it's going to be a very long message today. Well, anyway. Uh, we're going to take it up in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, I'm going to begin in the New King James. I may flip <coughs> versions. But we're going to sit like the Old Testament church and read the scriptures. It should be on your screens. It's not it's in your lap in your phone. And this is after the bows and the trumpets are poured out on the earth. And it's after we've seen 21 events or so of catastrophic things that are really just, just bombshells falling on the earth. Things coming to a close and Satan had his run, and Jesus has roped them and held, held them back and then released them again and uh, all kind of things. I don't fully understand the why, but, you know, I got the mind of Christ. That means I know enough about Christ to have his mind, but I don't know everything he knows. Can I get an amen? amen. And so this is subtitled, Revelation 20, I'm going to start in verse 7. It's subtitled, Satanic Rebellion Crushed. Now, I'm taking you to... I'm going to get it. Now, when a thousand years have expired, a thousand years in God's eyes, I don't know. Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, Jerusalem, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Come on, tell your neighbor, <laughs> Satan's going to lose. I mean, he's going to lose hard. Take it up in verse 11. The great white throne of God's judgment. He says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. So you have a set of books that really everything that you have done in your life is written. How many are happy about that book? <laughs> God saw it all. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh Lord, mercy. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. 
and they would judge each one according to his work. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In verse 15, and anyone not found written in the book of life. In other words, there are books, and then there's another book. Every name is written in the book, but only in the book of life are the names of those who's cried out to Jesus Christ, be my Lord and Savior. Anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to go here, but the book of Ezekiel says that after this great Omegadon battle, that Jesus is going to step again onto the Mount of Olives. And it says he's going to come again into the city of Jerusalem through the east gate. And he's going to stand again on the temple mount. And I've traveled there three times, and it's amazing when you go over to the Holy Land. You have Muslims, Jews, and Christians. And as our guide told us, he, you know, he was a Jewish guide. He said one thing, that they, they watched the press over here. He said one thing over here that they don't seem to know in the United States. He said Jews... Christians and Muslims over here know that the time is near. Know that the time is near. And you see things going on over there. And I, I, I brought one picture. Can you put that picture up? If I have it, hope it pops up. I saw it early. I know y'all got it up at media. There we go. I'm standing on the Temple Mount. I mean, I'm standing on the, on the Mount of Olives. And what I want you to see shows how aggressively this battle is. It's, it's, if you look at the bottom of the picture, you can't see, but, but right there, right on the lower edge, I'm standing looking out over a Jewish cemetery. And it's the most prized Jewish cemetery in the world. Every, every Jew would love to be buried in this cemetery because they believe when Jesus comes and he stands on the Temple Mount where I'm standing that those will be the first to rise. And so they want to be buried there. And then down in the bottom you have the Kidron Valley the, the, uh, uh, with uh, the creek known as the, 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 the Kidron Brook. And if you go up that other side that looks like steps, at the top of those steps is a Muslim cemetery. It was spiritually and strategically built there because that, that gate you see off to the right, that's the eastern gate. When Ezekiel said when Christ comes and he comes again, he will walk through that gate and then you see the gold dome, that's the temple mount, that he will stand on the temple mount. That's known as the dome of the rock. It looks pretty in the purse card. But my discernment, and this is where I could be wrong, Daniel, Jesus, Matthew 24, he talks about the abomination that causes desolation standing where it should not. All my studies say you're looking at it. It was built in the 7th century. So it's a, it's a Muslim mosque, old, fragile, about to fall down, the standing on the Temple Mount, the holiest place in the Jewish and Christian faith. And, and so the Muslims built that cemetery there knowing that Jesus was a high priest and he would not defile himself by being among the dead. So they know. And so they put that cemetery there to stop Jesus from fulfilling the word of God. But little did they know that the first the Bible says there will be a great earthquake. And little did they know that archaeologists have found the real gate sitting below that one underground. And little did they know that that structure is so fragile you can't even go in and it's condemned. 
So just a little shake, it's going to fall down. And he will take his place. And we'll get to that in a minute. I just wanted you to get a, a, a natural understanding of what's going on in the spiritual. And when you stand in that place in Jerusalem, everybody who went, if you go over that Temple Mount, it is the spiritual epicenter of the world. And you feel it. You feel it. Intensely. Even approaching it, I was like, oh my God, I'm full of the Holy Spirit, but we, this is hot. Revelation 21, 1 through 8. And this is titled, All Things Made New. And it says, Now I saw a new heaven. This is after the judgment, after the separation, after. He said, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw, I John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Okay, Jesus stands on the old Jerusalem, right? The new Jerusalem come down out of heaven from God. Prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him we thirst. He who overcomes shall inherit all these things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then out of Revelation 21, 22 through 27, is, is subtitled, The Glory of the New Jerusalem. And he says, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be, shall be, shut, at all, shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. You know, that's where this church got its name. The Lord gave me New City Church, uh, the Holy City. The New Jerusalem comes down from heaven. I hadn't even been the lead pastor but a, a few weeks, and the Lord just put that on me. Change the name, change the name. Right out of this, right out of the book of Revelation. And that's my, my heart and my goal and my passion is that everyone who stays, walks through these doors, whether you come or stay or come and go, that we will all reside one day in that holy city. The new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven where Christ is Lord and there is no more suffering, no more pain. Come on, no more tears, no more death. And I'm going to finish by reading just the last chapter of the Bible. 
Come on, so tell somebody the Omega. You know, sometimes when you read this, if you don't know Jesus today, it almost sounds like you must be somebody else talking. Jesus came and he went to the cross the first time. He would not be crucified again. Now it's time to choose, church. The first time he came to serve. The next time he comes to see who will serve him. Anybody listening to me this morning? The river of life, Revelation 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of his street, and on either side of the river was, a, was the tree of life. This, this goes way back to the garden that was lost, which bore 12 fruits. And each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. And when he says, no, I can't go. When he says nations, he's not talking about a natural geographic nation. He's talking about people who came from every nation. Let's make that clear. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There should be no night there. They need no lamp, no light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. And then Jesus says, it goes back and forth from the angel to Jesus speaking. And then John, and Jesus says, behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Come on, tell somebody to worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophet of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. And this is titled, Jesus Testifies to the Churches. To the Churches, Church. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter to the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Jesus talking. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. From the holy city. And from the things which are written in this book, he who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming quickly. And then Sean said, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And the final verse of the Bible, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
be with you all. Amen. This has been a rough series. And I can't imagine John on the island of Patmos hearing and witnessing these things and angels speaking to him. And hearing some of the terrifying things that are, that are going to unfold on the earth and the blessings and the rewards of serving Jesus. And he's looking around and at the world and said, Lord, just like the heart of Jesus, my heart is that none would perish, especially friends and, and family. I know some that just appear like that they're never going to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Lord, and I, I have co-workers and all that and the way they're going right now. And I read this, oh, my God, my God, my God, does it have to be this way? And then he reads the word of God and he said, it will be this way. And I love the way he says, he says, amen, even so, even as difficult as it is, even as, tra as tragic as it is, e even, even, you know, this that I'm so familiar with and these people I love are so familiar with, Lord, Lord, help. He, said, he said, even so, even so these things mu must take place, says, even so, come. Come, Lord Jesus. And then out of a full awareness, now he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Come on, how many need his grace this morning? Come on, without the cross there's no hope. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. There's an old saying, and there's a song that has this line, Jesus is my co-pilot. Anybody heard that? If Jesus in your, is your co-pilot, I suggest you switch seats. <laughs> Highly recommend you switch seats. <laughs> and give Jesus full control. No good soldier, church, tries to give orders to the commanding officer. Sometimes we even do that innocently in our prayers. No good soldier. A good soldier takes his orders from the commanding officer. There's, there's, a, there's a scripture in, in 2 Timothy Two, four. The, I, I, as a pastor, I zoomed in on right away with all the politics started coming into the church. All the other social agendas start coming into the church. And I'm standing here as a soldier of the Lord, ambassador for Christ, and a representative of him, looking at this word. And Paul, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 4, he said this, listen carefully, somebody may need to go home and read it over and over. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Let the word preach, Lord. Let it preach come November, Lord, preach. Entangled. Oh, I vote. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I vote. I vote. But entangled. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Some of us need to change seats. I want to encourage you this morning. Give Christ command in your life. That's a strong exhortation. Make Christ your command and officer. Come on. Joel 2.11 says, The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. You need to hear that. 
He who executes his word is powerful. His camp is exceedingly great. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it without Jesus? So what should we do? Just in a nutshell, I believe the, the commandments that the Lord will have us to do in this hour, uh, there's seven really. I'm not going to go through the scriptures, but number one, accept Christ's gift of salvation. It's not just getting saved. It's getting saved. <laughs> it's getting saved. It's not just belonging to Jesus. He, when he saves you to something, he's saving you from something. Believe the word of God. I read through these a, a while, but believe the word of God. I, I, I see so many Christians. I'm a Christian, but when you begin to read certain things out of the Bible, just like I just read, they don't believe that. Jesus said, I am the word. I believe the word of God whether I agree with it or not. And I just beat my flesh and my opinion into submission. If what I believe and what I feel does not align with the word of God, guess what? I'm wrong. And I have to be, have enough courage to stand before the, the whole world and say, I believe the word of God and the word of God say, says this. And if you don't believe that, I love you, but you're wrong. Have faith in what you believe. Now, I must confess, this is a struggle for me at times. I can have faith for everybody in this room, but somehow when I'm going through it, my faith starts to slip a little bit. Can I get an amen from anybody? I got to have the faith. And this is a big one, love. Everybody. Even your enemies. Even if you don't like them. Even if they smell bad, come on. <laughs> Love them. I had to discipline myself a long time ago. I hug so many homeless people now. I learned in Jamaica on a mission trip. I never will forget. Get off the bus, and, and we, we had a, um, a, a hospital, a, a, the government hospital. It was, it was awful. Get off the bus, and I see a man walking. His Jesus, here's what God gets you. There's a man walking down the hill to me with sores covering his body. Head to toe, running sores. And he's walking straight toward me. It's about 12 of us. He's coming straight for me, you know. <laughs> and, and I look back at the tour guy, and he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> what am I to do? I said, oh, I live or die right here. And I gave him the biggest hug. I didn't kiss him, but I gave him the biggest hug. <laughs> Guess what? I was all right. Love. <laughs> serve others. Come on, serve somebody. Spread the good news of the gospel. On the phone, in the grocery store, wherever, the workplace, anytime the Holy Spirit is saying, it's a good time. Help build the church. He wrote the, he said, I wrote this to the churches. What, what do you think Jesus means by churches? He means churches, plural. Not the universe, he's talking about churches. I got the, the churches. You need to be part of a local church body. Just skipping around. Not all, but some. Like I told the staff, if everybody who joined the church in the last 10 years was still here, we would need about five services. And that goes for every church in the area. When Jesus returns, or should I say before he returns, you're going to see some very disturbing things. Things we don't understand. And like I said before, the reason is because Satan will not go down without a fight. That's why Ephesians 6 says, take up the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day. Amen. 
So, you know, we look forward to the book of Revelation. And now I want to briefly just look back. You see, the, the preciousness of what was written before is way more precious once you look at the book of Revelation. Things that were said like Jesus said in John 16, 33. I've said these things to you that in me, you, you, in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulations. Take heart, I've overcome the world. That means a whole lot more to me with my understanding of the book of Revelation. Romans 12, 12 says rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. That means a whole lot more to me when I keep taking that glance at the book of Revelation coming back. Uh-huh. Psalm 16, 11, you, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there's fullness of joy. At your right hand, pleasures forevermore. That becomes a whole lot more precious to me. John 3, 16 through 21, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But let's go on. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him may be saved. He who believed in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he does not believe the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light. And does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen and that they have been done in God. Well, I got a lot of precious scriptures in the Bible. But one snapshot I like to capture, if you look at the first verse of the Bible, and the last verse of the Bible. Nothing, nothing's by accident. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Come on, do you believe that church? That's a big one. A lot of people don't. Do you believe that church? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the last chapter, Revelation 22.21 the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. For God so loved the world. Challenge you this morning. Don't neglect the book of Revelation. It was written to you, the church, so that you would understand what Christ is doing today. And that you would have Peace in the midst of conflict. Come on, tell somebody to have peace. That you have confidence in the midst of confusion. Come on, be confident. That you will, be, that you will have certainty when you're, when you're surrounded by hopelessness. And grab hold of this one. Joy in the midst of strife and anger. Come on, tell somebody the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. It's our strength. Because he who sat on the throne said, what is he doing? Behold, I make all things new. Come on, tell somebody he's making all things new. He's making all things new. And guess what, church? That includes you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Put that salvation prayer up quickly. Just, uh, if you're here today and you haven't gotten on the Jesus plane, which that means by default you're standing at the gate of the 666, don't go there. Join the Lord's army where you find joy and peace and hope. And you're not only saved to something, but you're saved from something. I want to take for granted that everyone here is in that camp this morning. So 
just going to ask, if you know you need to give your life to the Lord for the very first time, just wave your hand high and proud. I'm going to join on today. If you're here. I'm going to mention in the hands. All right, let's stand and put that, that prayer up. Come on. I'll pray to everyone here. And if you're not and just weren't quite ready to make that public de declaration, let's make it private. You can come up after the service and talk to one of our leaders. But let's pray this together. Not because you're getting saved again, but because you'll have a pattern when you're in the grocery store, you're in the workplace, and you had that conversation, and somebody says, you know what? Okay, I'm going. That you have a prayer on your heart. The prayer doesn't save, Jesus saves. But the prayer is that open confession, but you still have to believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth, Romans 10, 9, that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. So let's say this together. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I know that I am a sinner, and I repent for my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Today I've been made new. From this day forward, I will follow you. Amen. My prayer is that this week, this week, you will leave somebody in that prayer. Can I get an amen? Amen. I love you, church.